Thanks for watching the fourth edition of AI Research Weekly Update from Henry AI Labs. This week we'll cover things like the list of accepted papers at the NeurIPS 2019 conference, uh, new data sets and challenges published by Facebook AI and Google AI, and many more things. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for deep learning paper reviews and weekly update videos. The most interesting update to deep learning research this week is the accepted paper list from the NeurIPS 2019 conference. This contains 1,429 papers, so I wanted to share a quick little tip that you probably already used to just search through this paper list and find the research that's most relevant to you. So what I do is just a control F and then I type in my uh, individual interest, the keywords like uh, the acronyms like GANs or NAS for Neural Architecture Search, and I just use this to help me uh, find the papers that are most relevant to my interests. So the NeurIPS conference isn't until December, but there's going to be all sorts of uh, new data sets, challenges, and interesting stuff coming around with the build-up of the conference. Already we've seen Facebook releasing this uh, deep fake detection challenge, which is going to have the full release at this conference. We'll start off our tour of uh, blog posts and deep learning with this really interesting uh, post from DeepMind about experience replay and the analogies between neuroscience and artificial neural networks. So the article talks about how uh, with reinforcement learning agents, we can't always learn online. Like every time you have a new experience, you don't completely update and train the networks. So what they would do is they would store the experience in a replay buffer and then offline when the agent isn't performing the task anymore, it will replay the experience and update its parameters. So they have now interesting analogies between this kind of experience replay in artificial neural networks and deep reinforcement learning and what's used in rats as they navigate a maze and then humans as they try to do conceptual reasoning about a series of events. So this uh, study is about how rats have these spatial locations in their hippocampus which activate as which are associated with them experiencing different parts of the maze. So as the rat traverses the maze, they see these distinct activations in the brain. And then when it's sleeping, they see the same, uh, the same activations firing again. So they discuss two different kinds of uh, replay, movie replay and imagination replay, with imagination replay probably being more interesting for the model-based reinforcement learning people and probably generally it's a more compelling idea. But the movie imagination refers to when you replay, you replay it in the exact sequence of events that happen. Basically, you are storing the entire uh, experience. Whereas with imagination replay, you maybe just have abstract, uh, abstract things stored in the replay buffer and then your model of the world interprets how they might correlate during your uh, sleeping. So this is a really interesting uh, blog post and then it goes on to compare how humans, uh, how they do the uh, conceptual reasoning of a sequence of events and how this might provide new insights into artificial intelligence with respect to experience replay and learning from experience offline and online in deep reinforcement learning. More interesting news in the uh, buildup around conversational AI and digital assistance and natural language uh, understanding and processing is the announcing of two new natural language dialogue datasets from Google AI. So these datasets are the Coach Conversational Preference Elicitation CCPE dataset, which is based on like movie preferences, conversations where uh, two people are like recommending movies and discussing them with each other, and then the Taskmaster One dialogue dataset where you are doing things like ordering a pizza or scheduling an appointment. So in these dialogue data sets and the blog posts around them, I thought the most interesting thing was how they go about uh, building these data sets. And so they use things called the uh, Wizard of Oz system, which is uh, where they have the conversation but they don't really see each other. And then they have this interface for replicating the digital assistant interface with respect to the dialogue to build the data set. And then they have this uh, self dialogue entries, which I thought was kind of interesting, a way to get more data more easily is if you have just the same person uh, imagining the dialogue with themselves. So this data set, uh, the Taskmaster, you can see it on the uh, link which has 13,215 dialogues, which is a pretty large number, and then uh, this um, distribution of written and spoken, where the written is the, uh, the imagination of the conversation with yourself, and the spoken is with this Wizard of Oz uh, dialogue data set collection interface. Google published a really interesting article detailing their system uh, that gives Lens the ability to read text out loud to users on the Google Go operating system, which is like Android Go. It's a reduced version of the operating system built to run on uh, hardware-constrained mobile devices. So they talk about how they use things like uh, bounding box detectors, like the uh, RCNN and knowledge graphs, and the optical character recognition and all sorts of things in order to do this task of letting a user point the phone at some text and then the phone reads it out loud back to them. So this is really interesting. First they talk about how they uh, 
accommodate the algorithm for the uh, hardware constrained device and how they adapt to not being able to have a constant stream of high resolution images like you would have say in like the newest iPhone model. So then they discuss how they do the text recognition. They use a RCNN bounding box detector and then they use uh, optical character recognition, one of the oldest algorithms for this. And then they uh, use that to interpret the text from the image. And then they use this uh, text flow algorithm, which is where they basically do like a shortest path algorithm, like in, uh, you know, like graph algorithms in order to connect the characters and construct the sentences. And then they use the knowledge graphs to maybe correct some mistakes they might have made. So then they also talk about how they use, uh, to do the script detection, they use a separable convolutional network and a quantized LSTM, which are these kinds of things like separable convolutions and quantized uh, networks are used to reduce the model size of networks so that they can be used in the Google Go operating system. There's a really interesting uh, system that they describe, and then they give this video showing how this, uh, how this kind of application can impact people's lives and give this woman who can't read the ability to do things like use an ATM. Google also published a recap of the 2019 Fellowship Award and the Google PhD Fellowship Summit. So this is an interesting uh, get together for uh, AI researchers and it comes with a list of these talks which are really interesting for just seeing kind of uh, what people are interested in in the deep learning community at Google. One of the biggest issues surrounding AI and deep learning is the success of generative modeling and how it will be handled uh, in the use of information misspread. So one of the biggest problems is deep fakes, which is where you can generate videos of people saying things that they obviously haven't actually said. So Facebook's effort is to release a new data set fueled by things like ImageNet, which helps computer vision, and then the uh, miscellaneous natural language processing data sets. They want to build a data set that can be used to develop algorithms and compare benchmarks for detecting deep fakes. So they're uh, constructing this data set with paid actors to do different tasks where they will warp the faces into different characters. And they're dedicating more than $10 million to building this data set. The full data set hasn't been released yet and is gonna be uh, around the NeurIPS conference. Facebook is also releasing another challenge, a new open source strategy game called Mini RTS, in which there are two agents. One agent uh, gives out natural language instructions and then another uh, agent has to interpret these instructions to perform actions in the game. So it's kind of like a tower defense game and the most interesting idea with this, uh, with this data set and this challenge is the idea of having the agent generate natural language, high-level plans that get interpreted into low-level instructions. So it's interesting to try to figure out how we can make reinforcement learning agents have this kind of hierarchical composition of their ideas and their plans in which they can uh, interpret using natural language. Following along the trend of releasing new data sets and challenges, Facebook AI also published this about the first fast MRI challenge uh, and how they're open for submissions and overall details about what this competition is and how it can be useful. So the idea is that they have these case space uh, vectors that are used to describe the MRI and they wanna have generative models that can reconstruct the image from the case space model to make uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, much faster. They specifically say up to 10 times faster is achievable with their current uh, AI systems. So it's a uh, data set that you can get. The uh, reconstructions are judged with this structural similarity measure and uh, they have these two different things which is a four times acceleration with the single coil track and then four or eight with the multi-coil track. Also in the AI and deep learning news is an article published in the New York Times about the Allen Institute system named Aristo which is able to use natural language reasoning. Uh, it's kind of like an information retrieval system to pass an eighth grade science test. So the most interesting highlight about this article to me is the progress that four years ago they couldn't do better than 60% and now they're achieving more than 90% on the, on the same test and then more than 80% on the harder test. So this system is built using uh, the BERT embeddings and it is used to do information retrieval tasks such as this. Like a group of tissues that work together to perform a specific function is called and then it has to find the answer. So it's an information retrieval system. And then also in the article they talk more about the implications of these kind of systems and how it's easier for them to do things like, say in the GRE test, they're having a much easier time using these AI models to do the uh, like qualitative reasoning tasks compared to the math, quantitative, logic puzzle type of reasoning with the AI systems. Weights and Bias published a really interesting article about how their system is used for test-driven development and the development of the first 3D, agent, uh, 3D uh, engine for AI rendered scenes from latent space. So what they're doing is they're building uh, generative models 
and they talk about how they structure their workflow with the fully modular models and testing with rigor and how they use the weights and biases system to explore different hyperparameters. Like in this example, they have this visualization of how the learning rate, batch size, and optimizer affects the performance of the resulting model. So they discuss overall how they structure the system, how they do their uh, uh, pulls and new commits with the weights and biases system, and then uh, overall how test-driven development is used in uh, generative modeling, monitoring things like the FID, Frechet, Inception Distance metric, and then overall how they have things like if it is out of the distribution, they won't attribute it to a successful uh, like tweak in their system. Rather, they use the weights and biases system to do statistical uh, significance testing, and if it's out of the expectation, they attribute it to a failure in the metric rather than like having found some new technique to improve their models. So overall, it's definitely a really interesting article about structuring uh, deep learning products and uh, uh, projects and uh, workflows. Particularly, I thought it was interesting to see how uh, you might structure a generative modeling project, especially at scale like this kind of thing with a 3D engine totally created with generative models. Another really cool post is this post from TensorFlow about neural structured learning in TensorFlow. So to give you the high level idea of what neural structured learning is, is basically you have your training samples with labels and then you also have a structure of the labels which is used to compare the predictions, the distribution of class labels based on their neighbor lost as well. So this is a really interesting idea about uh, structuring learning and using it to achieve better performance with classification models, particularly in the setting where you have limited data. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting ways that this has been used. Uh, in the skin cancer classification paper, which became uh, so popular, they actually do use a system that's kind of like this uh, structured learning system. They have this uh, tree, which is how they structure the different predictions. So a specific kind of uh, benign uh, classification will first pass through this sort of uh, traversal, but, and then it'll be compared based on the neighbors rather than being treated as each thing being completely independent of each other. So it's definitely a really interesting idea. This idea of neural graph learning is emerging. It's one of the hottest ideas in deep learning, I think. You can see the ideas of how you construct these knowledge graphs to uh, have these kind of structured uh, neighbor type of loss added to the original maybe cross-entropy loss function used to train these classification neural networks. From NVIDIA's AI blog, we'll start off with Frontera, which is a new system at UT Austin, which uses over 800 NVIDIA GPUs and two subsystems to achieve a fifth in the top 500 list of the fastest supercomputers. They talk about how GPUs are used to accelerate different kinds of research in astronomy, medical breakthroughs, drug discovery, smart city planning, and then uh, weather modeling energy research. The next post from NVIDIA's AI blog is a company that is using uh, AI and deep learning, specifically with uh, sound recognition, to help prevent uh, illegal deforestation and help protect uh, the forests, especially with the news of the Amazon burning recently. So the way that this system works is it has these little edge devices which uh, hear the noises, things like a chainsaw, and then alert the authorities because they don't have enough... Uh, enough mo patrollers to monitor every square mile of the uh, forest, so they need these kinds of systems to help them uh, protect it. So this is a really interesting uh, application. Uh, using edge devices with deep learning will require things like uh, compressing models and uh, speeding up inference time, which is really exciting. They talk about how they are able to train their model in the cloud with uh, the IBM cloud and how they only need 100 hours of data to get started and get the system working well. Also from the NVIDIA blog, and uh, featured on their AI podcast as well, is a discussion about the Charter Communications Company, which is looking to improve the way that customer service is done by challenging the data lake model and using AI that can interpret data before people call to complain so that they can have a better uh, organization of their data and faster turnaround times with the customer service calls. One of the most exciting applications of deep learning and computer vision is to automate medical image analysis. So this paper is really popular right now in the deep learning community about a feasibility study on using automated deep learning systems like Google's AutoML to, uh, for healthcare professionals and see how well these systems can work on uh, classifying different kinds of uh, cancers and miscellaneous things in medical images and how feasible it is for the uh, healthcare professionals who don't have any coding experience to use these systems. So in the article, they provide comparisons with the AutoML vision system from Google Cloud with uh, things like the ResNet or VGGNet and miscellaneous uh, hand-engineered things that require deep learning expertise to sort of tune and get perfectly right for different data sets. 
So following this article motivated me to check out this tutorial on AutoML Vision. Uh, it's a really great tutorial. It only takes about 10 minutes to watch and it'll show you how to use the system. It's really interesting. They show how, uh, first it gives advice on collecting data and using videos to get more uh, image data for the class of, uh, for the task of detecting different uh, types of chairs. And then he uh, shows you how you structure your data as input to the AutoML Vision system. So basically you have this CSV file that has the path that the in the directory that the uh, you know that the operating system needs to traverse to get the images and then the label in the CSV. So then you load it into the AutoML ML Vision system and it's really as easy as just clicking train on this interface. So overall, a really interesting system. Really exciting to see uh, the future of automated deep learning and how these kinds of systems are going to improve the state of the art and make it more accessible to different people to use deep learning. This week's edition of The Batch begins with a discussion of a trip to Taiwan AI Labs, which is a nonprofit AI research institute similar to OpenAI. So I thought this was really interesting just to see uh, more of these kinds of labs being developed. Definitely good for uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence and the community of advancing this research. Also from the batch is a really interesting uh, neural point based graphic system that uses point clouds to represent complicated scenes. So I think the best way to understand this is with this uh, video uh, that describes the system from the authors. So they use these point clouds and uh, vectors representing each point to uh, parameterize and understand the uh, scene with much less data storage. Natural language processing systems are being used increasingly to automate the grading of standardized tests and specifically the writing portion of some of these standardized tests. So this post from the batch describes a study where they find bias in the way that these uh, natural language processing systems grade the essays and how overall an insight into fairness in machine learning and AI and particularly in the instance of using NLP to grade essays. The way that OpenAI released their GPT-2 model raised a lot of eyebrows in the AI community who felt like they weren't sharing open information and didn't have the code to reproduce the results and really claimed that their system was state-of-the-art. This discussion shows uh, the impact of how OpenAI uh, released their model and how they uh, encouraged the discussion of publishing these generative models and whether they are safe and whether uh, the AI research community should slow down and assess what kinds of things can be done with these generative models. So it's interesting in the landscape of Facebook releasing the deep fake detection data set, uh, OpenAI's scheduled uh, release of the increasingly complex GPT-2 models, and then the signing off of other uh, institutions like the Allen Institute to do this kind of scheduled releasing as well and be on the same page as OpenAI with the release of these models. The batch also describes a new technique from Google Health to augment digital microscopes with computer vision and augmented reality to improve the diagnosis of cancer. Following that is a discussion of a new technique at, from Facebook AI Research to compress neural networks using a product quantization technique. So it's really interesting things like compressing neural networks because they allow them to be used on more uh, devices with constrained hardware. And then following the, uh, concluding the summary of the batch is a discussion of this uh, deepindex.org which lists uh, many examples of how AI and deep learning is used if you're looking for inspiration and uh, overall like an aggregated list of different things that AI is used for. The Deep Index list of applications of AI also has this legend of how successful it is and you know whether it's in development or whether it's already uh, crushing it. So this is a really cool list of different applications, games, creative, home and lifestyle, professional finance, administrative, all sorts of things on the deepindex.org website. Thanks for watching the fourth episode of the AI Research Weekly Update video. If you're interested in learning about any more of these blog posts, please check out the links in the description. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs if you're interested in more deep learning and artificial intelligence videos.